Professor Steinhardt, how are you today? Welcome to Modern Wisdom. Uh, hi, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely fantastic to have you on. You're in good company. Some of your colleagues from across the U.S. have been on recently. Well, I'm, I'm happy to be part of their crew. <laughs> you are indeed. <laughs> so what are we learning about today? Well, um, I thought we might talk about uh, the discovery of a new form of matter, which I've written about in a recent book that just came out from Simon & Schuster. It's called The Second Kind of Impossible. And uh, it's, in, in one sense, it's a science story uh, about this new form of matter that people once thought was impossible. They thought for centuries was impossible. Uh, but it has a lot of other aspects to the story. It's one of the stranger scientific stories you're likely to come across. Wow. So a new kind of matter. Yeah. So um, there's always been this question about what ways that uh, exist for atoms and molecules to come together to make a piece of matter. Yeah. Um, how they arrange themselves is very important to how they behave, how that matter behaves and what it's useful for. Uh, it depends partly on the particular kinds of atoms, the chemistry, what particular combination of elements you have, but it also depends upon how they're arranged. So for example, we can take carbon, and if you arrange it one way, it makes diamond. And if you arrange the atoms another way, it makes graphite. Uh, the first, of course, is transparent and hard. The second is very soft and dark. And it's the same chemistry, the carbon chemistry, but just a different arrangement. And so that's been a prime issue in science. What are the different ways, mathematically and physically, atoms and molecules can come together? And we thought this subject was entirely settled by the 1980s. In fact, it was settled mostly in 19th century science. But what the book is about is how we were wrong, how what we once thought was impossible actually is possible. And, and then it goes on to talk about uh, a strange adventure that that led to. <laughs> <laughs> that, sounds fa that sounds absolutely fascinating. So what, are the, or what <clears throat> were the established understandings of the, the ways that matter could form? Well... Um, the ways that atoms can come together, it was thought, are very much like the ways um, you might uh, encounter if you were trying to, let's say, tile your shower floor. Okay, so <laughs> let's suppose you were trying to tile your shower floor and I gave you a bunch of squares. Uh, I think you're pretty confident you could tile your sh shower floor with squares with just leaving a little space for grout in between. But they would fit together nicely. Mm -hmm. um, you could also imagine, and you might even have hexagons or you might have rectangles or you might have triangles and you might have thought there were an infinite number of possible shapes I could provide you with. But actually, there's only a finite number, of, a handful that are possible if you were tiling your floor. If I gave you perfect pentagons, and by a perfect pentagon, I mean all the sides are the same length and all the angles are the same. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I asked you to tile, and I gave a bunch of those to you to tile your floor you might be somewhat embarrassed to find that it was difficult to put them together without leaving spaces in between. Oh, no. And that wouldn't, be, that wouldn't be very good for your shower. No. And, and then you might wonder, uh, is that uh, impossible to do? Or is it just that you weren't clever enough to figure out how to fit them together? And in this case, it's what I would call the first kind of impossible, something that truly is impossible, something no matter which way you put them together, you know from rigorous mathematics there's no conceivable way they can make um, the symmetry. Uh, they can make a they can make a pattern that fills your fl uh, floor without tiles your floor without leaving spaces. I got that. So it, as a beginning, one of the first discoveries that we found is that if someone gets their bathroom refitted and the tiler turns up with pentagon shaped tiles, that the they've got a hookster on their hands. Exactly. Exactly. And the same, <laughs> We're and the same already. Is, that's right. And it's not just true for pentagons. The same would be true if they came with heptagons, sevenfold or ninefold, or elevenfold, or 147fold. So there are really only five basic possibilities that you can use. And almost every pattern that you have seen or humans have seen up until the 1980s are patterns based on those five possibilities because we thought anything else was impossible. But we were wrong. Um, it turns out there's more ways to put, uh, uh, if you allow a little bit more freedom, there's more things you can do than that. But before we get to that, let me point out that there's, uh, this relates to the story of matter, because 
matter forms clusters, arrangements of atoms in three dimensions that fill space just like building blocks, children's building blocks, or just like tiles in two dimensions. And the same restrictions apply. If you ever had a, a, a building block which had the symmetry of a, of a pentagon or pentagons in it, uh, then the rule said you couldn't have matter with that form either, that there were only a restricted set of possibilities. Why, why can't you have matter with that form? The same issue. When you try to fit them together, they won't fill space. And so atoms hate having empty space. Their forces, the strong interatomic forces will rip apart the clusters and they'll make something else. They'll arrange themselves into some form that we call a crystal form, an ordinary crystal form like quartz or salt or sugar. Uh, and they won't uh, ever make a form which has, let's say, five-fold facets, facets of a pentagon. So, the, you know, we know there are of crystals that have facets which are six-sided and four-sided, uh, perfect four-sided and perfect six-sided or three-sided, but never up until the 1980s did we think it was possible to even put together atoms or molecules in a way that would have the symmetries of a pentagon. Got you. So, um, but um, there was, so, so it's, and, and, and all that could be shown rigorously mathematically that is to say, it was the first kind of impossible. If you actually tried to build geometric building blocks in this way, you'll find that you can't. Uh, so um, uh, uh, that was accepted, and it seemed to agree w with what we were finding in nature. Nature seemed to reject all these forbidden possibilities as well. So it seemed like a nice, tight, complete subject, nothing else to be said. Well, when the, when the theoreticians and the experimentalists all find themselves in the same camp, I guess you've got you've got a pretty big weight of uh, academia there pushing you towards one particular conclusion. Exactly. In fact, it, it would be on the first page of any book that you picked <laughs> up on the theory of solids that said, here are symmetries, here are patterns which are allowed, shapes are allowed, and here are ones that are forbidden. And prime among the forbidden would be anything with the symmetry of a pentagon. But there was a flaw in that thinking, and this, and so you know, when when scientists say something is impossible, or at least when I'm listening as a scientist, and the scientist says something is impossible, that always sort of brings up the antenna, and I begin to wonder, you know, which kind of impossible is it? Is it of this first kind, where it's absolutely rigorously impossible, or is it possible that they've made some assumption? There's some assumption which they're not even aware of, something uh, that everyone has been assuming for years, centuries but uh, has, is not quite true and may have a loophole in it. And if you can find the loophole, well, then you find something really interesting. You find something that everyone thought was impossible to be possible. So in this case, we, uh, my student, Dev Levine, and I, back in the 1980s, discovered a loophole in this thinking. And it goes back to thinking about tiles and atoms. So when I asked you the question about tiling your bathroom, one thing which I uh, slipped in there was I was only going to use one kind of shape. Um, now, crystals, in fact, are all made of one kind of shape of building block. And that building block repeats just like in a children's building blocks over and over again with equal spacing between the blocks. Okay. Uh, and all crystals are of that nature. But suppose I allow the possibility of two building blocks. And suppose... I allow the possibility that they do not repeat in harmony with one another. It's not like shape one, shape two, shape one, shape two, shape mm -hmm. one, shape two, but I have shape one appear at one frequency or one rate, and shape two appear at a different rate where they're disharmonic, or it's like an atonal sound, yeah. or a disharmony of sound, but this is like a disharmony in space. Then it turns out, what we showed, is that all the rules about what's allowed and disallowed get broken. You can form shapes with symmetries, uh, uh, tilings now. You can fill your bathroom with those two shapes, the entire floor, uh, with a symmetry which has five-fold symmetry. And, in fact, all the, all the patterns that you thought were impossible bef before, an infinite number, literally an infinite number of them, are now possible in two dimensions and in three dimensions. So if it's possible, then, well, maybe you can make it in the laboratory. That was the first question. It, it was theoretically possible, but maybe you can make it in the laboratory. And so um, uh, we didn't have to wait very long to find the answer because it turned out a few hundred miles to the south of us, at the same time that we were thinking of these radical ideas, 
uh, there was a, a group led by a fellow by the name of Dan Schechtman at the National Bureau of Standards uh, um, near Washington, D.C., and he had accidentally found a material that absolutely violated all the laws of matter that people had learned for centuries. In particular, it had symmetries. It had patterns with five-fold symmetry and could, in principle, make shapes with five pe- five-fold or pentagon-shaped facets. He didn't know what to make of it. He just knew it was somehow wrong, Mm -hmm. but he didn't have a theory to explain it. The theory was being developed a few hundred miles to the north, and we didn't even know about each other at the time. Um, But he wrote, he and his colleagues wrote a a paper, what we call a preprint, a sort of pre-publication version of this paper, sent it to a colleague that I had known for many years, who I had worked with in the past. Uh, The colleague didn't know what I was doing. But he knew I was interested in the in shapes generally, and he showed up one day in my office, and he um, said, "Oh, I have something to show you." I said, "I have something to show you because I want to show my neat patterns." <laughs> yeah, and it was kind of you know we kind of argued a little bit, but since he was the visitor, I said, "Okay, you go first. And he showed me this paper, and it was like uh, amazing because by the time you got to section two or three of the paper, what it showed was a pattern that you get that they got by shining electrons to this material and seeing the pattern they produced after they passed the material. We call this kind of pattern an electron diffraction pattern. It's kind of a fingerprint that tells you how the atoms and molecules are uh, uh, organized, gotcha. whether they are well organized or randomly organized, and, um, and also the shape, the shape that they're forming. And um, it showed a, a very distinctive pattern that violated the centuries-old rules of crystallography. But I didn't say a thing, because all I had to do was go up to my desk, because on my desk was a calculation that my student Dove and I had done of what you'd expect the diffraction to be for a quasi-crystal. I just picked it up and put the paper next to the pattern, and you know, they were, you know, to the, to the level one could tell by eye, the same. So wow. that's so much serendipity as well, and it's hilarious that it was someone who turned up in your office during the process that you guys were going through as well. Yes, because we had, we had been holding back our idea because when I had been showing it to people, they thought, oh, that's kind of interesting, curious, but useless because matter will never make this form. And, and then, uh, by accident, someone did. Is there an asymmetry there between the theoreticians and, and the experimentalists a little bit? Like, that if you've got something that's tacit and kind of appears in real life, that... There's, there's some more weight to it in the scientific community than, I guess, you've got the fear of uh, presenting a theory and then it being turned out to be complete bollocks when it, when it becomes real life? Uh, yes. I mean, especially in this field, in the field of you know, studying different forms of matter like this, it's very important that you don't just have a, a hypothetical idea, a uh, imaginative idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it was certainly important for everyone that I presented the idea up to that point. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was important that you know you could actually occur in nature because at first these patterns look complex until you get used to them. Uh, it's hard to see. In fact, if I show you the pattern, it's a little hard to see what the uh, what uh, to recognize what's going on in the pattern. But um, but as you come used to it, it begins to have a simplicity. But that's still not the same as showing that it actually has real physical relevance, that, that you can actually make this in the laboratory. Absolutely. And um, so, we, so we call this, so just like the ordinary, ordinary ordered forms of matter where you have regular repeating building blocks, we call those crystals, uh, we call this new form of matter quasi-crystals. Uh, quasi because when you have patterns that are composed of two or more elements that have repeated uh, disharmonic frequencies, mathematicians call that quasi-periodic, and they call crystals periodic, so we called ours quasi-crystals for it's that reason. Name. Yeah, and that's how the subject began. That was, and that's kind of the prelude to the story, if you like, uh, which explains why, um, we were, why I was interested in the story of quasi-crystals in the first place, because uh, they represented new forms of matter which would have new physical properties, uh, and there'd be an infinite variety to be discovered, a whole new world. Uh, uh, and, um, and, and this field kind of took off from there. But in terms of what I was doing, uh, we took a, I took a strange turn, mm-hmm. wh- which was to, uh, I was curious if we had made these things in the laboratory, why isn't it we had never seen them in nature? That was my, you've taken the question okay. right off the end of my tongue. 
Good question. Okay. Thank you. So, so how do you? So, you know, because we see lots of crystals in nature. There are thousands of different types of crystals in nature. How come we've never once, you know, thousands of years ago, or hundreds of years ago, or decades ago, seen a quasi crystal before? Is it because it's impossible? Is there something that's forbidding it? Some people in the field thought so. They said these things are so complicated, you'd only be able to make them in the laboratory where you can control the conditions just so. Mm-hmm put the elements together just so that they'd make this structure. Um, but um, the way we had come to the idea of quasi-crystals was not just thinking of them as building blocks. So I'll show you a little piece of a three-dimensional tiling here. It's a three-dimensional tiling, which is a piece of a quasi-crystal. It's kind of a, a layer of a quasi-crystal. Okay, you're able you. to for, for see the, all um, that? Yeah, yeah. For, the, for yeah. the listeners listeners who are just on audio, would you be able to describe to the best of your ability as well, please? Sure. So this particular um, structure contains four different types of tiles. They're, four, they're shown in, in, in the image in four different colors. Some are small, some are medium, some are large. Um, and they're fitting together in a pattern which, if you looked at the center of it, would have an obvious center of five-fold symmetry. And, uh, but there's more to this than that. It, they're held together by Lego-like joinings. But the Lego-like joinings are not all the same. And they have a special property, which is that if I gave you a room full of these units and asked you to fill the room full of them, the only way you could put them together without leaving spaces would be to make a quasi-crystal pattern. You could never put them together to make a pattern which has the symmetry of a crystal. Okay. So this is forcibly quasi-periodic, not just um, allowing it, but only allowing it. Yes. Now, why, why, do we, why is that important? Because it means if you could get atoms to do the same thing, they couldn't form the crystal. They could only form the quasi-crystal. Uh. And, if atom, and if you could find configurations of atoms that have that, and they happen to exist in nature, well, voila, you would have what, you, what you're looking for. So why not? Why couldn't this happen in nature? Why couldn't there be such a thing? Okay. Uh, so, okay, so how do you go about looking for this? Well, the first thing you might do is... Um, go to uh, museums, which is what I did. I went to museums and saw if there was anything in a display case that maybe had not been identified. That, that's kind of what I did at first. What do you mean? Like, that, like sort of remains and, 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 or are you talking about uh, exotic material? Well, I didn't know, you know. I, until I go to the museum, I don't know what to find. So what, so, what museums were you going to and what were you actually looking at? What was in the, what was in the cases? Well, so usually when you go to a museum, your eye is taken by the really large examples of crystals that are pretty famous, and those are not going to be misidentified. But usually in display cases, they're hidden below, drawers and things like that, and in the back rooms of museums, you'll find lots and lots of materials which are less familiar, which are less studied. So I was kind of hoping that I'd be lucky. So I went to the American Museum of Natural History. I went to the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, the Natural History Museum in Washington, uh, but none of that yielded anything. So that was that turned out not to N- work. Nice day out, but unproductive, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah, beautiful day out because <laughs> the, these, the specimens are beautiful and fascinating, and you, you know. But you know, no such luck. Yeah. So um, it took um, oh about fifteen years before I began to think of a systematic way of searching for quasi crystals, um, and it involved looking for computer data, looking through computer databases of electron diffraction patterns. Uh, so I could study many at once and use various mathematical tricks to search for ones that might be quasi-crystals or nearly quasi-crystals. And then we tried to find them, my collaborators and I would try to find them, bring them here to Princeton, slice them and dice them and see if they really were quasi-crystals or not. So I spent several years developing with a, with a bright student um, named Peter Liu. Um, I, I spent several years developing the mathematics and then actually doing the test. And there were many, many uh, adventures in just <laughs> collecting the materials. But at the end of a few years, um, no such luck. Okay. All the what, exam- uh, all what, what, years are, what years are we at now? Where are we now? Is this still 80s, 90s? So this was 1998 when we started. And by 2001, uh, well, Peter had now graduated. He was an undergraduate. He had graduated and gone on to do something else. Most of the team was disseminated by the end. We wrote the paper, and we asked, but we asked if anyone wants to join our little search, mm-hmm. write us, because we'd be loving, we'd love to have someone uh, join our search. And uh, unfortunately, no one answered that 
<laughs> that call. Oh, no. Uh, uh, but then, six years later, suddenly somebody did. I suddenly got an email from an Italian mineralogist, uh, head of the Museum of Mineral uh, Mineralogy in Florence. His name was Luca Bindi. Never heard of him before. The University of Florence is not a, you know, it's a nice, but not, you know, a major league mineralogy museum. But Luca um, volunteered to help us with whatever he had in his museum. And more importantly, he vol volunteered his incredible enthusiasm and energy. Almost immediately, he became as fanatical about this search as, as I was. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, sounds, became, that sounds yeah. exactly like a uh, Florence mineralogist, as I imagine one in my mind. I, well, ju I just I, think that they're like just full of energy and bouncing around the room. This is definitely Luca. And, uh, and actually his answering the call was one of the luckiest things that happened in the entire search because now we're, in, oh, it's now been going, I guess, uh, um, this was, uh, let's say, when he answered the call, it was like 2009. We began the search, I guess, 25 years earlier. So this is the biggest stroke of luck, uh, both because of his enthusiasm, because of his talent, and then it turned out he had something in his museum that we didn't, couldn't possibly have anticipated, which was, um, well, I should go back one step and say, so we started the process with him, or I started the process with him. Uh, I had a list of possible candidates for him to look at. He, he obtained them. He sliced them and diced them and no luck, failure, failure, failure. Uh, and then he finally suggested that there was some, he had a collection of interesting minerals in the store, storage room of his museum. They were in a set of drawers. Uh, and one of them, to him, seemed rather promising because uh, it had a chemistry which is similar to a known quasi-crystal, one that had been found in the laboratory. So, um, so he tried that one, and he sliced it and diced it, and he found there were some tiny little grains in there that looked very promising. He glued those onto the edge of a tiny glass needle, sent those to Princeton, brought it to Princeton, and... Um, and uh, when we looked at it under the uh, electron microscope, amazingly enough, it produced a beautiful quasi-crystal pattern. Uh, just the diffraction pattern that one would imagine mathematically, much more perfect than the sample that was found back in 1984, the first example, which was r rather a uh, sloppy, highly defected one. This was as good as anything man-made that I had ever seen, but, it was not made by man, or it didn't seem to be. It was in the middle of this very complicated little rock. It was, the rock was tiny. It was only a, you know, about a few, millimeters, a few centimeters big. Yep. But um, it contained lots of minerals in there and mixed in there, you know, jumbled up with everything else, mixed in with everything else, kneaded in with everything else with these little grains. And so, okay, we sh that could have been victory. That could have been the end of the story. We could have just said we found it, you know, Eureka, okay? Mm -hmm. and written a paper. Um, but as throughout the story, every time we think we're done, you know, another question emerges. And the obvious question is, but well, what would you have asked? <laughs> um, why is it only in such small, small amounts? Why is it so rare? Um, okay, that's a good question. And how is it that nature managed to make the quasi-crystal under conditions into which none of us would have ever thought to make it in the laboratory? Because um, these quasi-crystals, in this case, this particular example, contain aluminum, copper, and iron. It's a, a metal, metal alloy in this case. And those are highly reactive metals. And they love to interact with oxygen. And all the stuff around them is full of oxygen. So you'd never try to make a quasi-crystal in an environment which is anywhere close to oxygen. When we make it in the laboratory, we very carefully isolate the metals and cool them slowly. This rock was clearly cooled quickly in some places, and there's oxygen all over the place. So question, what has nature figured out that we don't know? Uh, and that actually is when the real adventure begins, because um, to answer that question took us on a sort of international journey of uh, detective story, intrigue, and mystery that took us, uh, that occupied us for the next few years. That sounds, it sounds, I'm reading the Da Vinci Code at the moment in amongst all of the nonfiction that I'm going through. And this sounds like the, uh, the, the, the mineralogist's version of the Da Vinci Code. It is in a sense. <laughs> it's, it is, it's definitely the strangest story you'll ever see. Uh, it required 
it's it's years of uh, I'd say extraordinary stubbornness on our part, like ex- <laughs> because there were so many points when when it seemed impossible to complete this or even to get started, uh, and you know, and every time it seemed impossible, something would happen that would save the day and get the story started again. Yeah. So just to just to start with that, the first thing I did is I tried to find it, the most famous geologist on campus who knew something about how rocks formed to ask him. Well, okay, here's our sample. Tell me. What is, say, how did nature figure out to do this? Uh, his name was Lincoln Hollister. He's you know, very well known. He's one of the first people to study lunar rocks. So he had seen all kinds of strange rocks and formations. And he studies exactly this question. Given a rock, how do you interpret or how do you figure out how it formed? So uh, I went to Lincoln's office, which is at Princeton, and knocked on his door. And I told him the story I just told you. And he sat there and he thought for a moment and sort of gave me a strange look. He said, okay, Paul, I hate to tell you this, but what you have there is impossible. <laughs> I, said, I, I said, oh, no, it's not impossible, Lincoln. Uh, we know these quasi-crystals exist. We even know this particular one can be made in the laboratory. And what well, he interrupted me, he said, no, I'm not, uh, nothing about the quasi-crystal bothers me. It's this business that you're telling me that this quasi-crystal has metallic aluminum in it. The Earth is full of aluminum. It's the third most common element in the Earth, but it's all attached to oxygen. Aluminum loves oxygen. It will never, you'll never find it in nature without oxygen present. So I'm sorry, but what you have there is some sort of, you know, refuse from laboratory or some industrial byproduct. It's been contaminated it, somehow. That's what it, he thinks. It's con- yeah, it's not natural. So we were ready to celebrate, but he was telling us no. It's, He's pooed on your parade. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Um, now, fortunately, because I've had experience with this issue of impossible before, I didn't stop. I, I asked him next, I said, when you say it's impossible, do you mean like truly impossible, like one plus one is three, what I would call the first kind of impossible? Or do you mean just very unlikely or impossible according to common assumptions, uh, but if true, might be really interesting? And... Um, at that point, Lincoln could easily have thrown me out his window or out of his, out of his office, but he didn't. He stopped and he thought for a moment and he said, well, if I were forced to come up with an idea for this, um, you'd have to, it can't be formed on the surface of the earth. It would have to be formed deep, deep, deep under the surface of the earth, near the boundary between the metallic core and the, uh, and the mantle. Um, and then you have to figure out a way to get it from there to the surface. But, you know, there have been geologists, including my department, who have hypothesized that one time there were plumes, um, like um, plumes that would carry material up from the core all the way to the surface of the earth that at one time existed. And if so, it could have been carried up very quickly and, and kept its form. Um, and I thought to myself, oh, it's very unlikely and bizarre that the story is true, but it's not impossible. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And if true, second it's really... Second kind of impossible. Second kind of impossible. And if true, really, really interesting, which then suddenly made it much more important to figure out what it was. Well, you've got geological implications now and... Right. And then I, and then I, and then I asked him a question, which I thought, which I'd been thinking about, but um, which I'd been thinking about, which is, well, how about maybe it was made in space? Maybe it's part of a meteorite mm-hmm. uh, um, because, I said stupidly, there mm-hmm. is no oxygen in space and that would protect it from the oxygen. Um, now, I didn't know at the time, but that was a really stupid comment because <laughs> there's lots of oxygen in space. <laughs> I just didn't know it. I mean, I'm a theoretical physicist who normally works on other subjects. This is all new to me. Yeah. So, um, so uh, and then Lincoln, unfortunately, again, didn't throw me out of his office. He just said, well, I actually don't know that much about meteorites. I'll take, but I know someone who does. Um, he's at the Smithsonian in Washington. I'll take you down there to meet him next week. And so we did. And when I got to the fellow in Washington, um, whose name was Glenn McPherson, even before I got into the Smithsonian, he was already waiting at the outside door. He knew we were coming from the train station. He was already waiting at the outside door. And before I could say anything other than hello, hmm. he immediately began to tell me how what we had was absolutely impossible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you when you arrived did you think i know what this guy's gonna say to me i've heard this one before no no i was hoping he would tell me something brilliant that oh this is very exciting you've discovered a new kind of meteorite oh, professor or, steinhardt yeah. this is what i've been waiting for yeah we weren't you here a, a few years ago and looking at all of the rocks <laughs> in the back room yeah yeah 
So, um, so then the, and the next few hours is just giving us reason, reason, reason after the, why this couldn't possibly be a meteorite. And so that's what began what is the real adventure detective part of the story was, well, what could we do? We could, number one, try to determine where this rock came from. Was it really not natural where, where, where Lincoln Hollister and Glenn McPherson write that it had to be, that it was impossible to really make in nature, that it had to be um, you know, some sort of a human by- byproduct, or is it possible uh, that we're missing something? Um, yeah. So, so how improbable, let's say that it was a contaminated sample, how improbable is it that something that was produced by humans and then had contaminated a particular sample would have had this structure that you're talking about? Because it seems like it's, even man-made is an incredibly rare structure to have found. That's a great question, Chris. And that what for me was prime motivation. Because even though they were telling me what we had wasn't natural, somehow, even through some random industrial process, it had been made in a way that we didn't know. So I felt I was kind of, to some degree, in a no-lose situation. Got you. Even there's, if there's either someone in Florence who's got a crazy production technique or there's something bigger and more grand at foot. Right, right. So, so what do you do? Well, uh, we did kind of two things at the same time. Uh, one operation was a detective story trying to actually trace where this little rock came from. And the other was to take the few little grains, microscopic grains of the material that were left now, because most have been pulverized in the process of getting up to this point, and use those to study in the laboratory any sign that would tell us for sure it's some sort of industrial process or sure it's not. And those, those two, both those two, two stories evolved simultaneously over the, or in sync, it's in sync, over the next two years, that almost every day there was something happening in one or the other. Almost every day, Luca, Vindy, and I were Skyping, and there was either some um, some news, um, some disaster, <laughs> occasionally some miracle happening along the way. I got you. So, uh, um, one thing that I wanted to interject with about here was: Did Luca have like a, a handling history for the piece of material? Because that would have, I'm going to guess, at least started you off in the right direction. Good. Another great question, Chris. You're following. You're following the detective story perfectly. Well, so of I, course, I, if you ever need, if you need an <laughs> assistant, I got Brit- British accent. In, I come from the land of Sherlock Holmes and Doctor Watson. So yeah, call on me when you need me. Well, this is very appropriate because uh, the detective is exactly what was needed. And so that's the first thing we did. We looked in the um, in the records of the museum. We found that the um, that the records show that the, this sample, along with three thousand other samples, uh, had been sold by a collector who lived in Amsterdam. It told us the name of the collector, the name of the collector, but it did not tell us an address of how to find him. Uh, and it had been sold in around 1990, but with a name. We could now, this is the modern day of the internet, you know, mm-hmm. you can go on the internet and you can literally walk the streets of Amsterdam, talk to people in Dutch, which I don't speak, using Google Translate, mm-hmm. and search for it to see if you can find this uh, missing collector. Uh, and at the end of a f- number of weeks of trying to do this, uh, no such luck, no, no finding. Uh. Uh, then the next thing we did, so almost simultaneously, was to search collections around the world because... You know, there was nothing that special about the Florence Museum or this rock, so far as we knew, um, or this material. So we started sending alerts to museums. There's various Internet sites which collectors use who collect minerals. And we got um, something like five takers, five people who claimed that they had samples of this material, four in the West, and one was in a museum in Russia. How do you, how do you send that sort of a broadcast out? Well, there's actually, for collectors of minerals, there's um, a website called mindat.com, and collectors use it to uh, exchange information about minerals, and they, I think they use it to, uh, I, I think, uh, also mineral sellers. You know, people collect minerals, they pay for them. Like um, e- eBay, eBay for rocks. It's like, it's like eBay for rocks, yeah, so it's very much so. <laughs> Sounds- but it also contains, but it's more than the seller, it contains all the scientific information. Okay. So you can read the properties of your mineral, you can see pictures of it, you can learn something about the history of it. Oh, nice. so, so, so we look for that, uh, so that's, and then they also, you can put out alerts. So it's a, it's a nice community in this sense. Um, and when we got the four samples from the West and we tested them, we discovered they were all fakes. Uh, That's to say, they were not the mineral that we thought. They didn't have aluminum, copper, and iron in them. They were all fake. So this is another side of mineralogy, which 
if you ever collect minerals, one has to be aware of, which is there's a lot of fakery in the minerals game. And counterfeit uh, rocks out there. Counterfeit rocks because, you know, when you buy art and it's a valuable art, you, you darn well get it verified by yep. experts. But rocks are not nearly that expensive. Mm -hmm. So, you know, someone says I have a novel kind of rock that maybe you read about in some mineral magazine as being a new, newly discovered mineral. Okay, you're going to buy it and you may, you know, you, you don't have the money or the machinery to test it. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to do so. You're just going to put it in your collection. Um, and some of these were museum collections that, I, where they were, that had them. Uh, uh, but what happened is a collector donated their collection, including the fake, to the museum, and the museum did the same thing. It doesn't have time to check yeah, all of its yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's how it ends up in museums. Um, and even today, because the story I'm telling you has now become somewhat famous, this mineral can be found at mineral shows. We've bought it from the mineral shows to check if anyone actually had found something legitimate, and we've yet to find something legitimate. Ah. So if you find these materials, claims of quasi-crystals at mineral shows, and there are very big ones around the world, um, like at Munich and in Tucson, Arizona. Um, beware, buyer beware. Or ring you, uh, ring you and send yes. you out. Oh, yes, right. But you see, it doesn't work like that. You have to buy first. <laughs> take your risk and buy first. You can't take your electro uh, the microscope over there and just uh, point it at the thing. and. I, I, you won't get your money back, let's put it that way, oh, okay. as far as I know. The show will have, you know, uh, have closed. The people will have disappeared. And no, I don't think it works that way. Mind that needs uh, PayPal seller protection and buyer protection on there, really, don't they? That would that would stop all of this in its tracks. It would, but it requires the testing. Now, the advantage was, uh, which worked in our favor, was because it's so expensive to test. Mineral collectors, when you ask, when you offer to test will snap up the offer. Uh -huh. And that's why they sent us the samples, because you might wonder, why would they send us their valuable samples? Well, they want to verify, because if it was correct, they win. And if it's not correct, okay, they understand. There's a certain amount of, that's part of the risk of the, of the business, you know, when you, or, the, or, the, or being in the collection business. Gotcha. So people accept it. But the one in Russia we knew was real, uh, because um, when the, the mineral that is contained inside, the, along with the quasi-crystal, there's, there's a mineral in there, which is an ordinary crystal mineral, which had been um, discovered first and um, published and officially accepted by the International Mineralogical Association. And when you get a new mineral um, accepted by the International Mineral Association, you're not supposed to put one in a museum. Uh, a copy, a, a version of it in the museum, which becomes a, a sort of the standard sample if case anyone ever wants to prove that that mineral actually exists. Uh -huh. It's kept. But by the same token, you're not allowed to fiddle with that sample, so we couldn't test it. They wouldn't allow us. The, only, the museum director would not let us test it. Uh, so we couldn't do it that way. So the, what do you do next? Well, you try to find the people who claim to have discovered that mineral back in the 1980s. Uh, so it turns out... Uh, well, again, going on the internet, we discovered the person. We, we discovered who were the authors of the paper that first submitted it, and then we began to search. It turned out to be a Russian. We searched throughout Russia for this person. We discovered that he uh, was once that he was at the time that he claimed to find this new mineral head of the Institute of Platinum. This is the 1980s, Soviet times. Head of an Institute of Platinum. Platinum is a very valuable defense material. This is a so, guy that you do not want to mess about with. Exactly. He's <laughs> connected. He's connected. Oh, and, wow. yeah, right. In fact, we, we heard some pretty bad stories about him. I bet you did, uh, yeah. With, with what he did with his competitors. Shady, in, shady Russians. Shady, yeah. So I think that's, I don't want to go too far in that statement. You can say that. I can say that, uh, yeah. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not a professor, <laughs> so I can call them shady all you want. But, but, but he was no, he was, he, he he had, you know, had various friends of his, or is purported to have various uh, competitors of his, I should say, mm -hmm. you know, uh, arrested by the KGB. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, disposed of or removed it from sight at least, so they were no longer competitors of his. We also learned they had emigrated to Israel. So the next thing we did, you know, was try to get the same deal in Israel, walking the streets of Israel find, and looking through the phone books. I found someone with that name, called him up, and um, he didn't speak. English. So I got a you know Hebrew speaker and called him up and he didn't speak Hebrew. Got a, a Russian speaker and of course he does speak Russian. Yeah. Uh, 
And he verified that he was the guy that was on this paper. That was the first thing. He, when I asked him, was he the person who actually picked that rock out of the ground? He said yes. And I thought that was great because now I could find out a lot more about where, whether it was discovered near a factory or somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Mm. Um, and then I asked him about his geological notebook. Where's his notebook that describing his discovery? And that's when things got a little strange because he said, I'm not sure. Uh, and you have to know that if you're a geologist, you always know day and night, any time of day or night, throughout your life, exactly where your geological notebook is. It's something you live with and record in. It's like a diary, you know, it's something. Okay, gotcha. Never gotcha. Lose. So, so the fact that he hesitated on that was a huge red flag. Uh, I'd been warned by Lincoln Hollister to watch out if he said he didn't know where his uh, oh, geological no. And then I asked him, does he have more samples? He said, well, maybe the geological notebook, and maybe there are more samples back in Moscow. And I looked up the price of flying him from Tel Aviv to mm -hmm. Moscow, and it wasn't a bad. I said, okay, what if I fly you there? Would you be willing to go retrieve it? He said, yes, but, and then it took a while, not just that conversation, but several conversations to figure out what he really wanted was a rather significant reward for doing that beyond the price of going to and from Moscow. Okay. Um, and now I was really worried because he wasn't able to answer any of my questions about details. And he, he might well go back, come back with a notebook, but how would I know when it was written? And he might say he couldn't find any more samples and, you know, Be how could humble. I trust so yeah, so it's a really tough decision. Should I let this go? Because this is the last thread left in the whole story um, that connects us to um, where the sample, where a sample might have come from. Uh, but eventually, I gave up on him. I decided not to pursue it. Mm. Uh, um, and um, so this was kind of one of those moments of impossibility. Uh, we had now looked at every through every museum, every collection that we could get our hands on, and the one person who who definitely had a similar material and all those, all those had reached dead ends. Uh, and then one of those things happened, which is um, one of the miracles that repeated throughout the story that sort of keeps you on the hook, mm -hmm. which keeps us, kept us on the hook, even when things look dire, uh, which just began with a simple dinner in Florence, uh, Luca having dinner with his sister and a friend of hers that she had brought to dinner. And uh, uh, the friend is not even a scientist, but he lives in Amsterdam. Uh, and so when Luca tells him the part of the story about there being a collector in Amsterdam, he says, oh, I live in Amsterdam. What's the name of the collector? And he tells him the name of the collector and he says, ah, that's too bad. That's a very common last name like Smith or Jones or something like that. And so that's not going to help you to find this person. But he said, there is an old woman who lives down the street from me. I help her collect groceries. She has that last name. When I get back home tomorrow, I'll just ask her just just off, on the off chance. Okay. Uh, so 24 hours later, an email comes, and he explains, guess what? She's the widow of the collector. No way. Yeah. And it's out of nowhere. So uh, as you can imagine, you know, the next day, Luca is there in Amsterdam <laughs> to try. <laughs> Luca's run there from He's Florence there. to Amsterdam. Absolutely. Which isn't such a long distance, but, you know, but, but he had, you know, he wanted to show up. She won't talk to him directly because she's a little intimidated, but she will talk to the friend. And the friend asked her, you know, does she know about her husband's collection? No, no, he, he was the collector. She knows nothing about the collection. He, he says, well, did he ever talk about his collection? No, no, he never talked about his collection. That was just his business and his business alone. And this went on for about an hour, asking every possible way, does she know anything whatsoever, yeah. anything, any tidbit of information she can offer about the sample? Um, and um, finally, she says, well, I really know nothing about the sample. I've been telling you that. But my husband used to keep a secret diary. And while the collection was so sold to Florence, I kept the secret diary. That sounds a and lot so like the notebook. Exactly, except it was a notebook of a collector rather than a notebook of a geologist. Okay. So it's where he purchased. He was purchasing minerals. Like a ledger. Kept, like a ledger, that's right. And sure enough, she brings forth the notebook, and in the notebook, it shows this sample. It explains that he got that sample. He, Well, he exchanged things for that sample in Romania, which oh, was God. Eastern The, the Russia. story gets more murky here, doesn't it? Yes, and with a fellow by the name of Tim. Tim the Romanian, uh, and um, and of course it was strictly illegal. That would be considered smuggling to smuggle minerals out in, during Soviet times. Yep. 
So uh, he, it was carefully described, you know, in sort of careful terms, mm. how this exchange was done. Uh, and when I heard the news, when we heard the news of this, I thought, wow, this is the, this is, with all the steps and we've had to follow, this will be the easiest step to follow, finding a Romanian named Tim who smuggled <laughs> animals. <laughs> will this take a day, a week, or two weeks, you know, or something yeah. like that? But six weeks later, That's no Tim. Him. And uh, in fact, I can tell you, I've never found Tim, uh, the Romanian. So this is, again, another dead end. And so as a last desperate, desperate attempt, we send uh, Luca back to Amsterdam to see maybe, maybe her husband told his wife something about a Romanian named Tim. So, um, so again, the conversation goes, this time she's willing to talk to Luca. Uh, and Luca's asking her and her friends asking her again and again, have you ever heard of this fellow named Tim? No. Anything about a Romanian? No. Anything about this trip to Romania? No. No, no, no. Nothing. I remember nothing at all, nothing to do with me or anything. Yeah. And then after she reaches a point of exhaustion, she finally confesses that although she really honestly knows nothing, her husband used to also keep a secret, secret diary. Oh, my <laughs> for probably the most questionable purchases in his collection. Okay. You know? And she brings that out. And there it explains that on this trip to Romania, he met this fellow Tim. Uh, and that where Tim is getting his samples from is from a particular laboratory in St. Petersburg. Exactly the laboratory that our fellow in Israel had been using all the time for all his work and mineralogy work. So now we know our sample isn't just similar chemically to the material that this fellow in Israel had. We know it is actually the same stuff. It's a piece of the same stuff. He took some of the minerals and he put one piece in the museum so he could claim a new mineral, but then the rest of it somehow got out of the country in exchange for something, you know. Oh, wow. Uh, the smuggling operation. And so now we know where we have to look for our sample. We have to look for wherever this guy really got it in the first place. Mm -hmm. By this point, we don't trust that he actually is the person that picked him out, out of the ground. We've heard enough stories. Yeah. and he. Yeah. But somebody did. And who is it? And um, I'll save you that part of the story. I'll just say another detective story eventually led us to find the person who actually physically picked it out of the ground back in 1979 and brought it back to this fellow who was in Israel. Uh, he was a student at the time, working for him in this remote area of Far Eastern Russia, in the, uh, in the northern half of the Kamchatka Peninsula, which is about as far north as far east as you can get in Russia. Oh, so, wow. I mean, that's like barren wasteland stuff, right? Yes, it's across a tundra in a set of mountains called the Koryaks, which, you know, so, so if you look at the, if you've, if you've ever looked at a map of the Kamchatka Peninsula, it's right across the Bering Strait from Alaska. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, and although people usually, th when you think of northern Russia, they think of Siberia, mm. it's actually geologically not part of Siberia. It's the one part of northern Russia which is not part of Siberia. It's a part of a tectonic plate which crashed into Siberia okay. at some earlier stage, along with the stuff that makes up Alaska and California. Uh, and so it's exotic geologically. Uh, the southern half you can visit these days. The northern half is still restricted. Even Russians, average Russians, cannot go there. Uh, why, it's why restricted, is it restricted for. Well, historically, for defense purposes, because it's the part of Russia that's closest to the U.S. Mm -hmm. territory, yep. and partially for mining purposes. It's rich in mining materials, so miners can go there. There are American mining companies there, but it's for historical reasons, various historical reasons, restricted. Um, and, uh, and when we found him, he you know, pointed out exactly on the map where, where this was, which helped us to at least recover some information. And he offered if we were ever, and I would say crazy enough, to want to go back and look for more material, um, he'd be happy to help us, wow. which was important if they ever needed to do it. Uh, now, at the time, I didn't think I'd ever think about going back. But in the meantime, something else happened in the laboratory that we didn't expect, which is when we were studying these grains that were, that were left from the, from the original Florence sample, we discovered after about two years, we discovered a number of things that told us it was very likely natural. But we finally found sort of the killer measurement, which showed us that the material was likely to have come from a meteorite, exactly the thing that Glenn McPherson has said it couldn't have been. Um, 
And a meteorite that wouldn't, wasn't just an ordinary meteorite. Most meteorites form rather recently in the solar system, more recently in the solar system. Um, this one is as old as the solar system. In fact, it formed before the Earth formed, formed before the planets formed. So we have a meteorite which has a quasi-crystal in it. Which, we have possibly a meteorite which has a quasi-crystal in it, which may have formed before the planets formed, which means it's also connected to the formation of the planets. It's telling us not only was there an exotic process that formed a quasi-crystal, but somehow it's a process which geologists and meteorite experts and physicists didn't know about, still don't completely know about, that nature figured out before there were even planets. Wow. And may have something to do with the core of planets, metals that make up the core of planets. Oh, so suddenly this was a much more important story than than um, than simply what was already an amazing story, which was finding a, yeah. a, a quasi-crystal in it. Uh, but we couldn't investigate any further because we were out of sample. All the samples were spent. Mm. So, um, so the only way to possibly get any would be to go back to this remote place across the tundra to the Koryak Mountains of the northern half of Kamchatka. You need to, you need just, to invade Russia. The way to get we, more of this is to invade Russia. Effectively, which means, you know, you ha if you don't want to, if you actually would like to get out safely, maybe with your samples, maybe you want to get their permission. Yep. But that means you have to get permission from the Russian government. You have to get permission from the FSB. You have to get permission from the Russian military. Then Chukotka, this northern half of, of um, Kamchatka Peninsula itself has its own government, its own um, its its own restrictions. Oh, bureaucratic Practical, nightmare. Bureaucratic nightmare, sort of a pile of paperwork, which <laughs> you know does, which is hugely, which is huge. You have to pull together a team that's willing to go with you. I mean, that's the hard, that's the hardest thing. That's want, that's hard. Do you want to go um, to the north of Russia potentially right. without any permission? Well, you, you're going to get the permissions. You're going to get the, You're going to have to get all the permissions in time to be able to go. You're going to have to uh, get money to be able to go. No self-respecting agencies, federal agency or museum, is going to pay you for that because any geologist would tell you it's crazy. Some guy found a grain in 1979. You're going to go back and you think there's any chance that he can find it, or even if he can find the area that you're going to find even a second grain. You know, the chances are. You know, you guess, you know, a hundredth of percent, a thousandth of percent of success. <clears throat> On the other hand, if you don't go, there's no chance of success. <laughs> so by this point, I've only told you some of the strange things in the story. Yeah. By this point, you have to imagine we're all in. At least I'm all in and Luca's all in. Yeah. You just have to take the story wherever it goes. So even if it's taking us someplace crazy, we go. Yeah. We pull together. I pull together a team. I get someone, a, a private donor to provide the money for us. Mm -hmm. I pull together uh, America, a combination of Americans and Russians and Luca and Italian to go with us. Uh, that includes my son, who is a, um, at the time was an undergraduate student at Caltech in geophysics and go on his way to Harvard. Um, he joins the team. He's my tent mate. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, everyone on the team is, exp I should explain one thing. Everyone on the team is an experienced geologist of some sort, including my son, is an experienced camper and outdoorsman. Except for one person, uh, which is me. Yes, so I'm, <laughs> I get it. So, I'm, so, but never. But you know, and I actually had hoped to send them without having to go myself. But <laughs> oh, yes. for various reasons, I won't. You know, you have to read the book to find out why I got trapped into going as well. Oh God. So, uh, so there we were in in July 2011. You know, this team going off to the literally across the tundra and two strange-looking vehicles behemoth vehicles, um, working their way across the tundra, sort of a roller coaster ride across the tundra for, for four days to get to this obscure stream, stream in the Koryaks, where in 1979, Valery Kriachko, this Russian who I had found, mm -hmm. uh, had found this earlier mineral. And, um, and then the story doesn't end being crazy there because you know, when you get there, you can't bring your electron microscope there either. So what can you do? You just collect and collect and collect material as much as you can. You pan it like you pan for gold because you know it has to have a little higher density than ordinary minerals. And you just bring back as much as you can, not knowing if you found anything at all. Oh, wow. Uh, and then when you get back, you have now have mil millions of grains collected from up and down the stream. And all you can do is look at them one by one by one by one by one. And um, with realizing that your chances are nil mm. of finding anything.
But uh, Luca, who I, I call the uh, Uomo de Miracoli, which means miracle man, you know, six <laughs> weeks later, uh, actually, I should say in the field, he had thought he had identified a sample. And six weeks later, when he actually had a chance to study it in the laboratory, it sure enough proved to have a piece of quasi crystal in there, exactly the same kind that was in Florence, attached to a piece that was now unquestionably a piece of a meteorite. So we were, were pretty confident when we went that it was associated with the meteorite, but now there was no doubt. And in fact, this whole story, which I reconstructed for you, this detective story, there are various points in the story you might wonder, well, have we followed the right trail or not? You know, maybe we missed a trail. Maybe we were mistaken one place or another. Well, now that we found the material ourselves in the same place, we knew at that moment that that whole crazy story was true. Uh, so we had actually uh, solved the, the mystery. We had been the a good Sherlock Holmes um, detectives and had solved the mystery correctly. But more than that, we now knew we had more material to look at. And by the t we've so far have found nine different grains and have been, little by little been putting, piecing together the story of, you know, when this meteorite came to Earth, some of the story of what happened to it in space, some of the bizarre things it underwent. Um, we've been able to reproduce some of the conditions in the laboratory. Uh, this meteorite underwent very intense high impact collisions in space, and that has something to do with the story, uh, how, how they formed. Uh, so we've been able to reproduce some of that in space. And we're learning from that new ways to make quasi crystals that, from nature that we didn't know were possible before. And uh, that's where the story is right now. There's still many things we don't understand, um, and that will be where the story goes from here. That's an absolutely mind-blowing story. I, I genuinely think that a novel made from this would be would be good reading. So the thing that's super cool is your uh, your first assumption or your first kind of hope, I guess, to make it a little bit more exciting and interesting was that this would be something which was created naturally and wasn't something which had been contaminated. Natural yes. was correct, but terrestrial was incorrect. Correct. That's right. We still don't have an example yet of a terrestrially made, an earthbound quasi-crystal. doesn't mean it's impossible. It just means we haven't found it yet. We haven't found an example yet. Uh, we've been focusing almost all this time on this one, understanding the origin of this one sample, because it, uh, over time, it accreted all this other important, imp other importance, mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. its connection to the early solar system. So we've really been, tra you know, focusing uh, almost all our effort towards that. But we'll swing back towards looking to for terrestrial ones, or maybe now that I hope, I also hope that we would inspire other people to look and maybe someone will find one before us. Before someone That's else to go, go, go and invade Russia. So um, as a, a kind of a concluding thought then, if you were to put your um, academic money where your mouth is with regards to this, what what do you think is the reason that these particular... Um, structures are formed why are they formed in this particular way and why does it only seem to happen in space or why what's the reason for it occurring and then what are the implications for us being able to create materials does this allow us to make soup anything that's super strong or super useful or super conductive well good questions um so um over the years, we've collected a number of possible theories of how this might be made in space, some of which have now been eliminated by experiments we've done since then. Um, but I think that two leading candidates are my, in my mind are number one, uh, what you might call uh, solar lightning. Uh, so in the early solar formation of the sun, uh, of the solar system, there was all this dust that was surrounding the sun before there were planets, uh, and dust can pick up charge and as it rubs against each other or bangs into each other. And some have speculated that this produces lightning. And uh, lightning is one way of detaching aluminum from, ox uh, aluminum from oxygen, or could, it's potentially some way of doing that. And so we've been thinking about that idea and thinking about adapting that in the laboratory, some version, not of lightning, but mm -hmm. some version of electrical um, charges mm -hmm. uh, of making quasi-crystals that way. Um, another idea is that um, what we see in some meteorites of this early age is that there are pieces of them that, that actually come from a different solar system. 
they existed before this solar system, before the sun ignited. Um, they have what are called pre-solar grains. And some of them are, have been identified already in meteorites. They're, they're quite different than the quasi-crystals. But maybe our quasi-crystals are examples of these pre-solar grains that would be formed from uh, nearby astro astronomical events, like the collision of two stars, co collision of two neutron stars or something like that, mm -hmm. producing a, a metal-rich material without producing much oxygen. That's what you'd have to look for. And we don't have, this is not a very well-developed idea. It's still early stages, yeah. but that would be another kind of idea. So it might actually be a visitor, for not just from outer space, but from even a different solar system. Uh, either way, it's telling us there are processes that occurred in space, probably not just once, but quite frequently in space, long before most of the minerals that we know on Earth existed. A, a, lo a lot of the minerals that are on Earth are formed only after life formed on Earth and the atmosphere became filled with oxygen and, and, and what was on the Earth reacted with oxygen. Mm -hmm. If you go back to these early stages of the solar system, there, were probably, there, were only, there weren't that many different minerals existing, but now we know one of them on the list is a quasi-crystal. In fact, I should say, it's not the only one on the list. There are three quasi-crystals, because by the time we got to this stage in the, in the, the late stages of the investigation, we didn't just find our original quasi-crystal, we found two other chemical compositions that made quasi-crystals. This meteorite was full of quasi-crystals. What, what were those made up of, or what was the, the um, characteristic of the structure of the other two? So one of them was a mixture of uh, aluminum, uh, nickel, and nickel and iron. Um, so iron and nickel are very common in meteorites, so the added element was the aluminum, as opposed to aluminum, copper, and iron, which was the first one. Mm -hmm. um, and it was interesting, it's especially interesting because whereas the first sample had the symmetry of a soccer ball or a football with lots and lots of five-fold um, pen pen pentagon uh, Fa uh, faces or pentagon symmetries. Uh, this new one only had sort of was was a stack, a, a regular stacking of layers, each of which had the symmetry of a decagon, tenfold symmetry. It was a different kind of quasi crystal, not just different chemically, but different symmetry, different di different category. So we found two different categories, and and the third guy turns out to have the same chemical composition, and I should say for these first two, there were ones we already knew existed in the laboratory. Mm -hmm. They'd been discovered ago, long ago, uh, decades ago, but now we found them uh, in the meteorite. The third one is again aluminum, copper, and iron, but the different composition than the first. Uh, and that composition would never been seen in the laboratory before. So that's the first example of a quasi-crystal that nature made and that we discovered in nature before we made it in the laboratory. Ah, uh, wow. We've, so we've since, since made it in the laboratory by using a technique which is un, not unlike what the way the meteorite created it, which is basically bashing together stuff together <laughs> okay. at high speed, at supersonic speeds. Uh, so we've learned something from nature. And, and, and then you ask, well, why would you care about that besides curiosity? Yeah. Why do you care? Well, because if you have new classes of materials with new symmetries, new kinds of atomic arrangements, then all their properties, their, uh, their hardness, their bendability or hardness, uh, their, their slipperiness, like Teflon-like slipperiness, the, um, all their property, uh, electronic properties, all those properties are going to be different in some ways. That, and you're gonna, what you're going to want to do is find examples that have the ideal chemistry and the ideal physical properties for whatever application you have in mind. So already um, we do use quasi-crystals in applications where you want uh, materials made of aluminum alloys, but harder than typical aluminum alloys. In fact, it turns out, by accident, we've already been using quasi-crystals without knowing it. There are certain, um, there are cer certain en uh, airplane materials that are used to sheathe airplanes, which had been, been used for years, but never studied in the electron microscope. Yeah. And by accident, when people studied it, they discovered it contained grains of quasi-crystals. And it had been optimized to be a hard aluminum alloy, and they didn't realize that what they were doing by accident was making something that was full of these quasi-crystal grains. By making it hard, they were, as a byproduct of that, creating the quasi-crystals, which was the actual reason for the structural integrity. Exactly. Without knowing that what they were doing is that you can that can happen in, in, in the materials game, uh, so you discover after the fact. 
Yeah. But of course, then you can optimize. Once you know that, you can optimize. And so there are quasi-crystals which are used for industrial parts and the like uh, for the, uh, under, the, under these kinds of circumstances. But the, another kind of application, which is, um, it, which is to make, uh, it involves in making synthetic quasi-crystals. By that I mean is, I showed you this uh, structure over here mm -hmm. uh, in this pattern. Imagine that I take each of these edges and I turn it into kind of a link and I make a network of those links rather than a network of solids. And then imagine I shrink that to microscopic scale. It turns out that kind of structure has a very interesting property when you pass light through it. It treats light much the way a semiconductor like silicon or germanium treats electrons. It for, it's a kind of semiconductor for light. Now, without saying in too much detail what that means, you, you know that semiconductors play a key role in the electronics industry. Mm -hmm. Everything in co computers, everything in your cell phone relies on integrated circuits, which are based on the physical properties of semiconductors, which provide, which are materials which enable you to control and manipulate the flow of electrons yeah. I, to, to transport energy or information. But there, uh, one of the goals in the future is to convert from electronics to photonics, to instead of electrons being the carrier, let light be the carrier of information and energy. Uh, it has lots of advantages. It moves faster, and it doesn't dissipate energy as much as electrons do. Now, you need a wire, but you know your wires already exist. They're called fiber optic cables. Those yep. are essentially the wires for light. Now you need the next important element. You need a semiconductor for light. And it turns out quasi-crystal patterns seem to be have certain ideal properties to make them ideal semiconductors for light, better than a crystal pattern, a crystal network of the uh, what we call a photonic crystal. So this is uh, taking advantage of, again, their unusual symmetry properties, the fact that they're much more spherical and much more symmetric than ordinary crystals. It so could be the basis just, of an a entire new uh, arm of the electronics industry. Or photonics, yes. Yeah, so Pho the photonics industry, yeah. Right. Right. So, you know, that's a subject which is or an idea which has been around for a few decades and is just beginning to really take off, we hope. But uh, we'll see. That's... But it's an example. We're taking advantage of this new new material is what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that Paul, that is really I'm, I'm speechless. It's a, a really fantastic story. I love I love how many different characters there are. It genuinely does sound like a work of fiction that happens to have occurred in the real world. It felt like it too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think um, I, I'm really excited to see what happens next. I'll be I'll be keeping my ear to the ground to to hear what's going to be coming out from the uh, if there's going to be any more new materials that will be found. So for the uh, for the listeners at home, where can they find the book? I'm sure there'll be a lot of people who will want to read more into the story and and find out more about the characters and the and the discoveries that you made along the last the last few decades of research. So where can they find the book and where can they find yourself online? Okay. Um, well, um, the book is available. Uh, the book is from Simon & Schuster. It's available um, on uh, Amazon and, and maybe in local bookstores. Um, or you can uh, make the contact and learn a little bit more about the story by going to my website, which is called secondkindofimpossible.org second kind of impossible without any spaces in it, mm -hmm. uh, .org. And uh, there you can, you know, learn a little bit more about uh, what we're doing and, um, and also, you know, where to get the book and all that. So uh, I think people, or I hope people will enjoy reading the story. I've gotten very nice feedback on it so far. And, um, and, uh, and, and, and you can also uh, write to me if you have any questions or reactions. I'd love to hear what, what people think of it. Amazing. I'm absolutely certain that uh, that people will want to find out more. I will make sure that the link to your website and the book on Amazon will be in the show notes below. And if I get any questions sent through, I will act as your uh, envoy, your uh, f mineralogist envoy, and uh, I'll, I'll pass on the messages to yourself. So to the listeners at home, if you do have any questions, feel free to contact me on my usual socials, Instagram, Twitter, etc., etc., and I will make sure that Professor Steinhardt gets them, and I will try and report back as accurately without bastardizing the uh, content as much as I can. Well, thanks so much, Chris. <laughs> it's I been look forward a, to it. It's been fascinating. Thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, it's been fun. Catch you later on. <laughs>
of the